So here we are with uh, Professor Rajiv Bansal of the University of Connecticut, and I'm very excited that we have you here on sabbatical at Arizona State University in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society. Welcome, Rajiv. Thank you very much, and I'm very excited to be here. I'm spending only half a semester here, but it's been wonderful so far. Well, we've had some coffees already. This is coffee with Katina. You seem to have your coffee, and I don't, as usual. <laughs> um, but I've enjoyed our coffee breaks together. Yep, I enjoyed talking with you, and I am looking forward to this chat as well. So I first met you at the GETS conference. That was Gary Marchant's from the law school, Governing right. Emerging Technologies. Yep. Um, and it was a wonderful conversation we had there. I think we started to talk about the IEEE Society on the Social Implications of Tech. Right. And I was blown away. I mean, what's your background? Where are you from? What have you been doing in your career? Right, so I trained as an electrical engineer, as an undergraduate student, and did a PhD in applied physics, but still close to an area that is within electrical engineering. Uh, since 1981, I have been on the faculty at the University of uh, Connecticut, uh, where I served as the department head for nine years from 2000, uh, I guess, till 2018, 2009 to 2018. So uh, I have also been serving on behalf of IEEE as a program evaluator for electrical engineering for accreditation purposes. So every year I go out to some university and uh, look at their uh, program. And uh, as you may uh, know, uh, ABET requires that all engineering graduates should uh, demonstrate their familiarity with the broader issues that are involved with engineering design. I mean, they especially uh, mention uh, social, uh, ethical, uh, uh, societal, global, that all these issues should be uh, taken into consideration. And most engineering programs uh, do that uh, as part of their uh, capstone design project, but it was my experience that uh, most of the engineering students in the course remain more focused on solving the technical problem at hand rather than uh, thinking about the broader context in which they are doing their engineering design. So in 2017, uh, two colleagues of mine and I uh, came up with a, a course that is required now of all our electrical engineering majors and computer engineering majors. So they take it either in their junior or uh, senior year. And they don't do new uh, technical content, but what we do is that they uh, read a number of uh, short pieces, which we discuss as a group in the class. They write about these uh, technical subjects in the broader context, and they also make a, a presentation on this. So that was uh, one way in which uh, my teaching uh, sort of moved in a direction where I became more interested in the uh, societal implications of uh, technology. Can I say um, that's pretty honorable uh, and it's very insightful. I think we have a lot of computing schools and engineering schools across the country, in, in fact globally, that don't understand the importance of societal issues or ethics and don't want to integrate it into their programs. In fact, uh, when I've been in the role of accreditation back in Australia with the Australian Computer Society, mm -hmm. uh, there was a little bit of resistance, particularly through new engineering programs in mechatronics or biomedical uh, engineering. Why do we need ethics? You know, I remember uh, bumping into a head of school once. Mm -hmm. He said to me in <clears throat> 2014, well, ethics is not what I do. I do biomedical stuff. I do biomedical engineering. And why is ethics important to me? You know. Ethics should only be important after I commercialize and roll out the technology into the marketplace. And we had an acute discussion right. about the pros and cons <clears throat> of waiting to bolt on ethics after the fact right. rather than embedding it in the design process. So how, how's your experience been? Have you seen resistance? Have you seen acknowledgement that it's required? 
Well, as I mentioned, it is now required by uh, ABET. So in the U.S., engineering programs have to come up with some way of demonstrating that their students have indeed had this kind of exposure that they have considered this. Some of them outsource it to a department like uh, philosophy where the students might take a course in uh, ethics. But ABET generally uh, requires that not only should you learn a, a subject matters such as ethics, but you should demonstrate how it is applied in practice. And so that requires some consideration of it, either through the capstone design project or through some other course uh, that has been taught within the engineering framework, rather than relying solely upon some class that has been uh, taught by the School of uh, Liberal Arts. So uh, it is not something that comes naturally to engineers. Uh, for a long time, even the IEEE did not have a code of ethics, but uh, now they do. And I'm glad to see that it has also been periodically revised to keep up with the change in uh, social values. And so that uh, we are not mired in some code that was developed 100 years ago, and we simply blindly keep on parroting the same uh, thing. So, so that's uh, good. But uh, to uh, get back to the point that a lot of uh, engineers feel that they could think of uh, ethics or other broader issues only after the technical product has been designed or when it has been marketed, sort of a bolt-on uh, uh, approach, uh, I feel that it is more important to try to introduce uh, these kinds of uh, frameworks while the students are still in a more receptive mode, when they are still in uh, the engineering school where they are probably influenced more by some of the faculty members who are trying to talk about these issues and who can probably also discuss how these issues might have come up within the context of their own uh, professional lives. And I think that is likely to have a longer lasting impression on uh, a future generation of engineers rather than simply relying upon some uh, ethicist who has been hired by a company along with a lawyer who uh, reports to the general counsel's office in the company and relying upon them for uh, compliance. It's fascinating. Um, I was employed here at ASU uh, as a joint hire between the School for the Future of Innovation in Society, uh, which you could broadly say was social sciences and humanities, uh, and with uh, the computing school, informatics and decision systems engineering. And one of the things that I was faced with is the question whether you have a unique course dedicated to ethics or you attempt to embed ethics throughout the curriculum in key subject areas or course uh, disciplines. For example, I could have a, a course called ethics, I could have a course called privacy and security by design, I could have a course on big data and the digital society, or I could perhaps speak with curriculum chairs, uh, discipline leaders, subject matter experts and say, okay, you are teaching deep learning, mm -hmm. you are teaching ethical hacking, uh, you are teaching databases. How can we embed ethics within these courses individually? But it is this constant wrestling of, but my course is already flooded with 15 weeks of curriculum content and you're asking me to give some leeway, you know, when I don't even have time for that important technical stuff. You're asking me, uh, for some time dedicated to ethics or culture or society or human and social dimensions. Talk to me about this jostling. Right. And I think that it is a constant uh, struggle because uh, many of the faculty members themselves went through programs where they did not have these kinds of modules that deal with uh, ethics, professionalism, uh, or uh, privacy or security issues in their program. And so they are probably in their own mind, they're probably not convinced that there is something within their 
uh, technical content of the course that they could remove so that they could make some room for it. To me, it would seem that if rather than having a standalone course, similar to the one that I offer, which I consider more a stop rep uh, measure, mm -hmm. if such modules could be embedded throughout the uh, curriculum, it would be much more effective because then uh, what students learn in one course would reinforce what would come next and they would not think of it as something that is just a one-off uh, offer. It's this constant debate, I think, Rajiv. Um, I've spoken to so many people who um, have wanted to have more liberal studies in engineering programs. And what we don't want is the graduation of one-dimensional engineers who look at technical problems and say whether something is feasible or not feasible technically, given the resources, hardware and software and processes that are available to them. I, I think back to the classic socio-technical diagram of the 70s where it was all about humans, tasks, mm -hmm. hardware, software, and the organizational structure. And I think one of the reasons we have seen so many big failures of IT systems implemented into different corporations globally, you know, I think up to 70% of IT projects fail, uh, is because there hasn't been this human dimension or social dimension that's been taken seriously. And so when I look at, for example, program committees, uh, that are responsible for computing science curriculums. And they tell me, oh, your proposal in your course doesn't have any technical implementation, thus it is not considered computing. I simply go back to the methodologies and the frameworks and theories we've been you know, taking seriously mm -hmm. now for decades and decades. And I say to myself, but okay, this course still has problem definition. This course still has a requirements analysis component. It still requires a high-level design. It requires our students to have interaction with real patrons and humans and stakeholders. And yet sometimes the response is, but it's not about implementation. You know, there's no programming language in your course. And you say, but isn't this the problem to begin with, that we are focusing our attention on the implementation and our students are brilliant at programming in Java. They're brilliant at C++. They're brilliant at Python and web services. But where are the interviewing skills? Where are the thinking skills of having participatory approaches mm -hmm. to development and design? What do you feel about this? Right. Uh, I, I think that uh, to me, this is a continuum. There would be places where there would be people would rely simply upon other departments to provide them whatever type of training is needed or call for in terms of uh, ethics. There would be other where they would succeed in trying to embed it, if not in all the courses, but in several of the courses. In some, there would at least be a consideration of these when students are working on a team project that continues for a whole year, so that for at least one full year, they have a chance to consider some of these factors while they're also using their uh, coding skills and design skills or other things. Uh, I could see that there would be, uh, given that the number of uh, credits that is required to complete an engineering major has not increased uh, significantly. In fact, in some places, it has decreased to bring it in line with a four-year degree program, for example, in the humanities or social sciences. So trying to add a new technological content at the same time when we have also become more sensitive to having a discussion of these kinds of broader issues is a, a challenge. But uh, to me, uh, you, the point that you made that even in a course where there may be no formal coding or programming, many of the skills, uh, whether they are of critical thinking, whether they are skills of communicating, uh, being able to think out of the box, being able to think of how to design a product where user preferences have been considered, these are all valuable skills. And when we talk with our uh, engineering alumni, uh, we hear this very often, that uh, these kinds of skills probably serve them 
even more than their uh, foundational engineering skills when it comes to career advancement. So I hope that with time, with uh, some trust from accreditation agencies and with more such programs being uh, developed, that the environment will change so that there, this would become more acceptable uh, than it has been uh, so far. So my critical question to you is, why now? Why has this, if I can call it, quiet movement begun uh, at this time? What has propelled it forward? Uh, uh, then I should perhaps refer the question to someone who has studied the history of uh, technology uh, more seriously, but uh, my own uh, reading uh, seems to uh, suggest that for a long time uh, the public had much greater confidence in what they considered expert scientific opinion. But uh, the way things have developed, the way some of the negative outcomes of uh, technology have come about, we no longer enjoy that unfettered uh, trust that we once had where it was felt that if these experts in technology are developing something, then that would, ipso facto, be a threat term. Mm -hmm. And that's no longer uh, accepted. Uh, well said. I, I think you're probably alluding to here as complexity, uh, systems of systems approaches. Uh, we have higher interdependencies, uh, greater mesh networks and involvement at multiple layers of the stack. Uh, if we look at the uh, open systems of interconnection model. Um, there are all these cyber physical systems now. The complexity is increasing. Um, and so we may be having a greater risk. Uh, we may be having uh, more failures right. uh, with, with, with higher stakes. Right. And I think that uh, some of the social scientists who have uh, looked at the nature of risk inherent in these increasingly complex systems would argue that some of this risk could not be eliminated. And so whether even a particular technological approach should be pursued as a solution to some important problem is something that needs to be uh, re-examined rather than just moving forward, assuming that we would take care of the problems if and when they arise. And here we could allude to uh, Professor Andrew Maynard's work on risk innovation, whereby we capitalize on understanding risk and perhaps creating new innovations. Right. And uh, I'm very excited by the idea that uh, he has uh, developed a framework and this uh, risk innovation uh, hub where they would try to work with companies, which might even be in the startup phase, and trying to get them to think about the kind of orphan risks that become obvious only too late and may completely jeopardize the business model that they may have. So it's, I think it's a, a, certainly a noble undertaking. Uh, startups are often strapped for both funds and time, and so therefore it's not going to be an easy sell. But I think uh, it's great to see that at least something in the direction has been attempted here at ASU. Yes, he's a, a very interesting colleague, I would say, in, in the school. Um, uh, his approach to teaching ethics via science fiction movies is, is fascinating, uh, grounded, and uh, has increasing numbers of students interested in the concept and in his classes as they're growing in size. My question now pertains to how do the students feel about it? You know, you and I, uh, you know, have gone through perhaps our industry experience, our academic career paths, and are excited by the idea of bringing in the human and social dimensions into computing and engineering schools. Um, but what about the students? You know, when I first came, I was advised, Katina, don't put privacy in the title of your uh, computing curriculum uh, course because most students in computing would possibly be turned off by the title. Um, see it as boring. Don't put the word ethics in there. Put something else. And so then I started to get creative. I thought, what if I had a course on autonomous systems? And really the course was about privacy and security by design. 
what if I had a course on big data in the digital society, but the course was really about, um, you know, analytics and law enforcement and medical applications, and you have to get rather crafty. But whether you're overt or covert about your intent and the student cohort, what has your experience been by your students at the University of Connecticut? So, uh, in comparison with you, I have had only a limited amount of experience in trying to embed uh, these kinds of uh, broader issues within the uh, engineering program. But in the uh, course that uh, I have now taught for about uh, three years, I have found that uh, in terms of the comments that I received from the students both in person and in, in terms of the feedback that they uh, provide at the end of the course, that most of them seem to have enjoyed the kind of discussions that we had in class. And even though engineers don't automatically look forward to a uh, long written assignment, <laughs> but I think that uh, going through it, uh, they have found that uh, these are important issues and a course that brings awareness of it to them uh, would be useful to them. Uh, what uh, I found a little bit puzzling is that, uh, as I mentioned, I met you at this uh, law school uh, conference last year and you were the one who introduced me to uh, your colleague Andrew uh, Maynard, and I was impressed that you know, here is someone who's trained in information technology, he is a person who's trained as a physicist, and these are people who are now devoting serious time to uh, research, outreach, and teaching uh, in these kinds of fields. And since I uh, talk about lifelong learning to uh, students all the time, I thought that maybe I should take some of my own medicine and when I have an opportunity, when I'm finished with my administrative responsibilities and when I have an opportunity to go on a sabbatical, to spend it somewhere where the ecosystem is built on the belief that it is important for the uh, future of the society, that we take these kinds of broader issues, user preferences into account right from the get-go. It's um, been certainly a pleasure having you at ASU to encourage us. I think often uh, many staff feel like they are working on their own. I'm sure we have those uh, ABIT measures in the computing and engineering schools that we have to uh, achieve or at least match and, and, and we are uh, accredited on those measures uh, for our undergraduate degrees in particular in the US. Um, but how do we theorize, how do we think about, how do we critically reflect on what constitutes this new movement? If we were to say ethics is one component, talk to me about other things that you think might well be things that we will be instituting in these schools in the next sort of 10 years. Where are we going? So you mentioned ethics. I think that uh, here I have found that another uh, pillar, in the at least in the school for the uh, future of innovation in society has been the notion of universal access and social justice and, and this recognition that very often uh, technology, whether it is nanotechnology or whether it is even as simple as uh, batteries that are made for flashlights or something else, they might be used by consumers in one society but they may be manufactured somewhere else where the standards for manufacturing are more lax and therefore uh, it may put, the actual manufacturing process may put the well-being and the lives of people at risk. So I think that making these kinds of uh, considerations, uh, making students aware of them while they are going through the engineering program is important. One thing that I noticed here is, uh, uh, as as I mentioned, as part of my lifelong learning mm -hmm. experience, one thing that I've been doing at ASU is to sit in on a number of uh, classes myself, starting with a class that uh, you taught, I think, a year ago, uh, FIS 111, which sort of introduces students to the notion of uh, welcome to the future, what kinds of futures they can uh, uh, imagine for themselves. Uh, recently, I had an opportunity to give a presentation uh, in the class myself, mm -hmm. 
And uh, before my presentation, I asked the students about their background. And I was expecting that many more of them would be there because they are pursuing the program in the School of Inchnam. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that these students, it was a small class that is drawn from many different disciplines. But there was no one really who was from electrical engineering or uh, mechanical engineering or something like that. So this is one thing that I'm hoping for is that at an institution where there is such a commitment to having a whole school devoted to the notion of uh, the future of innovation in society, that there would be more dialogue and more active collaboration between the School of Engineering and between this school, so that the people who are discussing these kinds of issues, people who are doing research on them, are not simply people who are outsiders looking in on the people who are actually engaged in the process of innovation, but they are the players themselves. Right? I think well said. I mean, um, sometimes we can preach to the converted. Right. Right, yeah. and uh, you get a nice choir. Right. Uh, but the real uh, assimilation uh, and instruction has to happen who, to those people who are on ground zero. Right. So I believe there's two things happening with what you're identifying. One is a new breed of tactile, interdisciplinary workers who are technology-oriented but may not have a technology degree. And the second thing is players on ground zero doing the implementation, doing the building, doing the design, who need to acquire a human and social dimensions touch. And I think at ASU we're trying all of these different experiments. I think uh, Professor Michael Crow, our president, uh, pulls a few strings often and uh, loves to gamble uh, on different models to see which one will emerge as the one that works. Right. You know. I mean, it's in the nature of innovation that there is <laughs> yes. some risk in it and one does not know always ahead of time. It's also true of academic research. What pathways will turn out to be blind ends and where uh, we would see light. But I, I think that uh, the more uh, cross-disciplinary work that we would have and the more uh, we have starting from an early stage in academic programs, uh, I think the larger the footprint we are likely to have for something like this. So I've sort of looked at it in uh, three different models that we could implement. One model could be um, you have a, a Bachelor of Engineering or a Bachelor of Technology or a Bachelor of Computing and you bring in the liberal studies uh, subjects, courses that might exist in philosophy, sociology and so forth. So we are trying to perhaps uh, imbue and embed certain principles within the traditional engineering schools. The other one is to take what has happened to me as a joint hire, take someone who's multidisciplinary uh, with several degree backgrounds and bring them in, share their responsibility between two schools and hope for cross-pollinization. Mm -hmm. And so you still have your distinct programs, but you have programs like the one I've proposed uh, that we hope will get running soon, like the Masters of Science in Public Interest Technology that takes four core courses from our School for the Future of Innovation in Society, the brand new, uh, looking at co-designing the future. And then you run all these electives in your traditional engineering and technology school. And then you have this cross-pollinization between the joint hires, between students who are doing courses from both uh, faculties. But then there's this new model. And yesterday I was on the phone uh, with uh, an esteemed professor emeritus, uh, Larry Bucarelli and also Professor uh, Greg Adamson from the University of Melbourne. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor Bucarelli has been from MIT, mm -hmm. um, has been at MIT for a very long time. And what is emerging now is this move. Well, why don't we have something called a Bachelor of Arts in Engineering? Why don't we have, you know, a Bachelor of this or that in the humanities or STS schools, but with brackets in engineering? And that is, almost flipping this uh, issue that we're facing uh, on its side 
it's inverting it. It's not saying we go to the computing schools uh, to make individuals aware of ethics, culture, and society. We do that anyway, but we are also possibly going to invest time in what we used to traditionally call in Australia uh, a Bachelor of Computing Studies. It's not a Bachelor of Computing. It's not accredited by ABET, but it's almost deriving engineering as one of the arts, it, just like geography, just like English, just like a major in history, just like a major in um, some other field under the arts banner, and saying, well, if we've done BAs for this and that, we could have a BA in engineering. Tell me what that right. makes you feel like. So I think that uh, your own background is in information technology. I come from the hardware side of electrical engineering. So it would seem to me that while in principle, the notion of offering a Bachelor of Arts, which would be in engineering, is an interesting concept, it will be easier to implement it in certain types of engineering, perhaps more in the area of computing, also in the area of uh, biomedical engineering or biosciences, which already tend to involve a lot of biology and uh, several engineering uh, disciplines, and maybe harder to do in some of the uh, more uh, traditional areas, such as uh, mechanical engineering, which require a more regimented sequence of uh, engineering uh, courses before the person will have the necessary uh, skill set that will be in demand by the employers where the person will be confident that uh, he would be able to do the design. Now, there's one thing that even though engineering programs are accredited by ABET, at least in the U.S., in general, there is no licensing requirement for engineers. So that allows for a great deal more flexibility than would be possible, for example, in programs in medicine or in programs in law. But ultimately, especially in the U.S. where higher education costs so much, uh, students and certainly their families are also looking for a pathway that would allow the student to gain uh, meaningful employment in his or her field. And so I think that these the idea of having the Bachelor of Arts, which is infused with engineering, is certainly worth thinking about, and it's worth thinking about how uh, we could do this. Would it have to be necessarily in one specific subdiscipline of engineering, or as such programs exist, for example, at Cornell and even at uh, uh, the University of Connecticut, could it be a more general engineering physics type program where people would learn, uh, would take certain engineering courses, would learn how engineers think about design, but where they would not become specialists in one particular uh, area of engineering. I think I concur with you on the caveat that uh, despite that we don't have a licensing system here exactly, uh, that you don't want a BA in engineering building bridges, right? right. However, the emergence of what I would call a systems engineer, not really confined to biomedical or software or uh, mechanical or mechatronic or, or anything like this. Um, in fact, the first company I was employed at was Nortel Networks. Actually, it was a third company, forgive me, but my first long-term role in industry uh, back in uh, 1996 uh, into the early 2000s was at Nortel Networks. In mm -hmm. fact, I was employed as a graduate engineer despite that predominantly I had computing and information technology courses and mathematics, of course. Uh, but I had this uh, extremely interesting bachelor's uh, introduction. It was a sandwich course. We did six courses a semester. We worked in industry for a year out of the three years. And literally, I think we were programming six languages in, in, in a semester, typically. Mm. Um, we were in the labs for the majority of the time or in industry. Okay, for a third of that period, while still continuing coursework. We were paid, we were sponsored uh, by cooperative organizations, but actually they knew what they were creating were robust individuals who could apply themselves to any domain of technology or engineering. Now, a lot of that cohort of 24 students ended up in the big five at the time, consulting companies, 
and then there was a there were mergers and we ended up with four from six originally um i happen to have uh, experience at anderson consulting which is now mm -hmm. accenture uh, and otis elevator company uh, but then we had students at pwc the banks uh, macquarie bank westpac uh, ibm a lot of the students went to ibm uh, but what we all realized is that though we came out with a BIT, a Bachelor of Information Technology, that's a BSc here, mm -hmm. or a Bachelor of Science, we all ended up with strange titles. Now, what we're seeing over time, you know, we used to talk about the I, right, in the iPhone, or mm -hmm. uh, NTT.com.o came out, came out with their early orientations of C mode or I mode, right? These were the apps and the services they were selling back in the mid nineties when we still had WAP uh, as a protocol for wireless technologies. But over time, the I became an E. So we had IBM pushing E business. Everything's about E commerce. Everything's about E human resource management systems, E finance. And then we've had this big burst now with the tech word, the FinTech, you know? the Bitcoin, but the um, tech this and health tech and fintech and uh, whatever tech you want. We've had this change of the guard. And I think it, eventually now, it doesn't matter what course you do at ASU, you will be exposed to computing. Right. And, and what's happened now is that the world has caught up in disciplines. Every discipline has databases. Every discipline has business processes. Every discipline has... Um, project management software tools and uh, electronic customer relationship management systems with lead databases and e-finance and e-this and e-that and tech, tech, tech. It's almost like we are graduating students no matter where they are because we've got students in high school doing robotics. Mm -hmm. We've got students in kindergarten doing robotics. So what we are coming out with are now professionals who are e-certified by default. And I think what, we, what has happened is we've caught up. So when we're talking about BAs in engineering, I definitely don't want to see those Bachelor of Arts students creating the bridge. But I want to see those BA students coming out and being expert interviewers and identifying clearly the problem. So when I used to work in industry, I was on the solutions advisor section of the network engineering role at Norto Networks. There were, for example, the solutions architects. Mm -hmm. And there's a distinction there. The people who are fluent in the ontologies of technology engineering, they get high-level design, they get problem definition, they get requirements analysis, but they are also able to pass the spec along to the solutions architect to delve deeper into the dimensioning of traffic, of bill of materials, of what is the best architecture to actually implement this solution with. And, and I think this is true, that I mean, irrespective of the name, whether you add an I or an E or tap to some other uh, product name, in the minds of many of the high school students, in the minds of uh, a lot of people, software development, uh, developing apps, these are the things that are driving a lot of technological progress some of which has been labeled Industrial Revolution 4.0. Yes. So you were right that there, there would always be people uh, who would be doing the work of uh, specialists within a field of electrical engineering or nuclear engineering or aerospace engineering. But there would also be a lot of people who would be doing engineering in a broader sense, who would be using their skills in uh, computing, there are still some uh, systems design. And when you think that uh, there would perhaps be more of such people who would be in the engineering field, it would become more logical to have a BA in engineering and uh, leave the BS in engineering to people who are doing more specialized work in each of those uh, disciplines. Yes, I, I think that's an interesting thing we've come to in this discussion. Um, and I'd love for those BA engineering students to also have a secondary interest, for example, in the field of Indigenous studies or in the field of homelessness, maybe social work, uh, in the field of um, data collection, you know, historians. Um, and I think that's how we start to enrich why we are building, what we are building, where we see our future as an, a world going. I think 
what we are at the moment experiencing is this sort of pseudo bubble. You know, we are upgrading from one phone to the other. Uh, I was talking to somebody, one of the providers here in Arizona the other day, and they were saying, Katina, you've had that phone since 2013 and it still goes. And I said, yes, we've changed a few batteries, uh, but it's a wonderful phone. But it clonked out on my son the other day. And so we had to upgrade. And he said, well, phones are only made to really last one and a half years. And I said, yes, we studied that in planned obsolescence. <laughs> but I think as we become more mature as a society and we look at the negative externalities of dumping uh, mobile telephony, uh, hardware, printers, all sorts of things created by plastics, uh, we become more acutely aware of the environmental impacts, but also of impacts to people who don't have access to these wonderful technologies for communications. Uh, to education, I was reading a, a, a fact that we quoted in our first editorial of transactions on technology and society for the IEEE. On and how by many... the way, congratulations on Thank you. getting that off the ground. That's a major undertaking. Yes, and yeah. I can see we're already getting amazing papers about these topics um, in peer-reviewed outlets, which is wonderful um, at the transactions level. So how do we get these technologies uh, into people's hands that require them and people to have access to information uh, for all of these things. But we were reading about how many children don't go to school. And it was one in five in developing nations, right. which is unacceptable. If we can look at going to the moon, then we can certainly look at the equity required to give every child clean drinking water and access to computing, so and access to information, right. access to an education, the right to an education. And so when we are theorizing about what may that BA in engineering look like, my hope is that it's not just a one major, it's a double major or a triple major, <laughs> as some people have opted to do. And maybe these are the people that will make the change in our society that will count. Uh, I don't know if uh, such uh, a major would become widely popular since many of those students seek the path of least resistance and would try to see how they can finish a program so they could mm -hmm. uh, get a job. In fact, very often uh, engineering students choose their courses that are not required by talking with other students and finding out which would be easier to do. But the point you were making is a good one because hopefully there will be some and they would be the ones who would represent the next generation of leaders. And if we have such thought leaders, if there are such people who have had a broader experience while they were going through uh, their own uh, college or graduate school experience, uh, maybe the future would be brighter for all of us. Yes, and I, I look at this dilution actually of, um, in America in particular, how many students who maybe begin at universities actually end their university or college degrees. Uh, and we are looking at this struggle of turnover uh, and maintaining students, student retention because of student experience when um, so many of the jobs today just require a Cisco certification or a Microsoft certification right. or a certification in this or that, Oracle. Um, and I'm not saying that we don't need those people on the ground to go straight into the workforce, but I think we're going to see a multiplicity of offerings through various course instruction. I know uh, when I was at the University of Technology Sydney doing my bachelor's degree, Cisco were knocking on the door for the Cisco lab uh, that followed to the University of Wollongong. And so there were Cisco-led experiences um, when we created the e-business course at Wollongong uh, with Professor Doug Sivita in the early 2000s. We had a course that was much provided by IBM. It was an IBM certification. Students completing our course could actually sit those certifications. So I think it's excellent to get a grounding at university uh, in the broader courses, but sometimes those certifications are invaluable in particular positions. It depends what you want to do. How do you see that changing the landscape? Right. Well, I feel that one has to be careful because uh, very often when a company comes to the university, yes. it is looking for some short-term need that it perceives. And it would be convenient and economic for such a company 
if this kind of training, whether it is with Cisco or IBM software or something else, could be provided while they were still students, rather than the company having to spend the time and the money to provide this sort of training after the fact. But as we know, within our own lifetime, technologies are changing much more rapidly. Mm -hmm. Software is evolving at a much faster rate. And so it's important for students who are going to be working as engineers or technologists for 30 or 40 years to have the broad foundation and the type of skills that allow them to keep on learning mm -hmm. and not limit themselves just to the it technologies because they need to have a path that would be flexible enough so that even though the world changes around them, they would continue to be useful. You remind me of um, my mathematics high school teacher, uh, Mr. Kerry Kiriakou, who said to us, everybody, I've got one piece of advice for you. Stay at university for as long as you can, because <laughs> then life happens. And so it is very interesting. You know, last year I went to the conference called NICE, 2019. NICE was about cybersecurity, uh, and we had a lot of companies present. There was a lunchtime talk by IBM, and there was a lunchtime talk by Microsoft executives that were all talking about public interest technology, PIT. Mm -hmm. And they came out with some very radical ideas. Here, I'll share one of them with you. Uh, we want people who are studying music to come into the field of computing. We want them, we want these people who think differently about the world to come in to cybersecurity. And I was sitting there thinking, whoa, <laughs> that's different. Because while we are creating programs like this proposed Master of Science in Public Interest Technology, we have created schools like the School for the Future of Innovation in Society. Where are the jobs? You know, uh, when people go to recruit, companies are looking for that brand. They're looking for the traditional engineering or computing or information technology students, but no one's heard about the future of innovation students. Who are these students that do innovation? What do they offer? What skill sets do they have? But then I hear these re this rhetoric from big executives like you know chief operating officers or chief cybersecurity, the CISO officers. And I think to myself, are they for real? Do you think, Rajiv, we are going to see non-traditional students enter companies like these large information technology service providers? Well, I think that in some areas I could see that uh, that would be happening, but very often uh, what one may hear from the CEO of a company does not translate into uh, ground level recruitment at uh, entry level uh, positions. I mean, uh, just uh, I think the, an example that has been true for a long time is the notion of communication skills. Virtually all the people who rise through the management ranks and eventually have a place in the C-suite would be strong in communication skills. Mm. But when you talk with engineering students, there are relatively few who are at a place where they can appreciate how important it is going to be in their careers down the line. But to me, what seems worthwhile is that uh, you mentioned a Bachelor of Arts in Engineering. Well, even engineers are required to have a three-dimensional education. They're required to have a broader education. Maybe we could require them to select a minor so that uh, rather than simply taking a potpourri of uh, unrelated uh, courses, they would declare some area of interest and then try to take these uh, courses that provide them the breadth in their education that would be directed toward some particular goal. Now, if they're interested in music, that would be fine. If they're interested in uh, outreach or social work, that's fine. But maybe providing some sort of a theme. And I think there are some institutions that try to do that. But uh, to me, that seems more uh, viable. That you, know, you would still have an engineering graduate who would have solid engineering credentials, but the person would also have some other passion or some other interest 
that she has pursued uh, while bringing those uh, henchmen liberated. Um, this year in November, on the 12th to the 14th, uh, we're hosting the International Symposium on right. Technology and Society, um, ISTAS. Yes. It's been an annual conference now right. for about 30 years, uh, bringing together a couple of hundred people at most uh, to discuss these issues. This year we're hosting it uh, at Tempe in Arizona um, mm. at ASU. I think it's a great location considering mm. how much ASU has to offer in terms of innovative programming, not just in the area of engineering and technology, but in many different ways, I think that would be wonderful. And I think uh, uh, the ASU motto is that you try to provide both access and excellence. And maybe this is a message that something that would be important even in terms of uh, ISTAS. And at that conference, um, I can confirm as of yesterday, uh, we are going to hold a two-day engineering education workshop led by the brains of uh, Larry uh, Bucarelli, uh, the MIT Professor Emeritus uh, from STS, who is thinking it is his idea to look at this Bachelor of Arts uh, in Engineering together with uh, Professor Greg Adamson of SSIT. Um, and I'm hoping that's going to be fruitful. What One of the things as an outcome we want are uh, to create 25 open modules in various areas of importance as proposed by the delegates. Mm -hmm. These could be things like culture mm -hmm. and other STS sensibilities where the systems or the, the modules that are created, the actionable uh, outcomes of this workshop will be uh, open modules, but also how do we go towards creating an open letter, mm -hmm. a concerted, concise, open letter that we can reach out to all the engineering schools globally? I think that would be wonderful. It seems like a great start. And I think uh, ISTAS, I have been to only uh, one of these conferences, but they have been relatively small conferences. And uh, to some extent, it seems that we are preaching to the converted. Yes. And I think it would be wonderful if the mission could be broadened uh, and we could see how we could make changes in engineering education and how we could actually have uh, actionable items such as developing these kinds of modules that would facilitate this task of broadening the experience that engineering students have. I think um, that's one of the discussions we've had over coffees, how to draw in organizations like uh, the local companies here in Arizona that are burgeoning, whether it's Medtronic, whether it's Intel, Honeywell, uh, the list goes on and on. You know, we've got so many local organizations to call out to and organizations that are thinking differently. Um, you know, when would the title Human Rights Commissioner ever be linked to a technical organization? You know, a Human Rights Commissioner or a a uh, global data privacy expert or uh, privacy abuse and misuse manager. So we have these creative titles that obviously exist because there is a need, okay, and we were talking about the need to begin with, but I keep telling my students to look out for these very non-traditional titles if they have an interest, if they have a sustained, you know, they've gone through their uh, training and they've looked for these courses on AI and the future of work and robot and human collaboration and autonomous systems. Like, look out for these specialist roles that are starting to pop up yeah. in, in job recruitment. Right. Well, what I hope is because I think one thing that I have uh, seen that many institutions and universities have created titles in terms of uh, because of societal pressure, such as the chief diversity officer. Mm -hmm. But unless uh, such people are supported with an infrastructure and the resources within the institution, it does not translate into actual uh, change in uh, behavior, into an actual change in uh, the culture. So I think that it is great that at least uh, some of these uh, new titles that synthesize ideas from the wider culture so that we are moving beyond the notion of uh, 
uh, C.P. Snow's concern of the two cultures, that the science people are here and uh, the humanities and social science people are there, but that we would uh, genuinely have in uh, different institutions, whether they are in the uh, private domain or in the academic domain, uh, these kinds of titles and these kinds of people who are trying to combine uh, the best of both. This is why I really love talking to people like you. I think um, you, you, you crystallize a lot of things for me. Um, you're very encouraging of the trajectory we are on here at ASU, but I also think people of your service and experience you know, make things apparent to us. Sometimes we are living in this this process of change and dynamism and we don't actually, we, we feel it, but we can't put words to it. And so when you talk about companies not merely providing titles, but actually a concerted infrastructure behind them, part of that infrastructure is actually supporting with budgetary resources. Right. Uh, and so... You know what we have today when we look at AI, uh, Professor Alan Winfield um, of UWE, uh, a well-known global roboticist in ethics, as ethicist as well, has often said, look, we've got a AI principles from this company and he he's keeps updating his blog from 17 to maybe 25 now, uh, principles of companies, of European Commission, of, right. you know, the, the White House and, you know, we've all got principles. We are having a very difficult time in abiding by them. <laughs> and so I think this will be the human condition that we are ongoingly attempting to move closer to what is not only viable, but we should be doing. Um, and that will take practice. Right. But I, uh, I think that, and you probably believe it too, that it's better to light a candle than curse the darkness. So I think that uh, <laughs> yes. what you have started here, what you're planning to do in terms of the uh, conference, that's a wonderful start, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. And with um, a few minutes to go, I want to close in you imparting some of your philosophy um, from your teaching life, your research life. Um, yeah. What would be that to, to a multiplicity of stakeholders who are listening? Right. Well... Uh, as I walk around the uh, campus at ASU, it's a beautiful campus, but I see everywhere uh, the president has some of the principles that are uh, considered uh, uh, the core of the new university that ASU is trying to uh, become. And uh, when I uh, thought about them and I found that uh, many of them would actually apply uh, to my own career as it has developed. I think one of them is that you need to know your uh, place and you need to know how you can leverage it. So, for example, uh, uh, this university happens to be in a state where it is possible to have a lot of solar power and so therefore research that is connected with that would make sense. Uh, when I joined the university almost 40 years ago, I found that uh, we had a uh, laboratory that did research in summary implementation systems. So it seemed natural that some of the research that I would do would be uh, uh, connected uh, with this. So I think that that connects with uh, one of the pillars there. The other is that uh, you want to be, a, uh, since we are at a university, you want to be able to do things that would help the students succeed. Mm -hmm. So one thing that uh, has been important to me is uh, to have an open door uh, policy uh, for the students to come in, whether they are undergraduate students or they are research students, mm -hmm. and to provide them uh, uh, not just answers to the problem they may be facing at the moment, but simply as a sounding board, because sometimes people have issues and they want someone uh, whom they uh, consider in part as a father figure or in loco parentis, and to provide uh, the, that kind of guidance uh, if it is needed. So that's uh, another thing. Uh, the third thing that I've noticed here, which is BIV, and which uh, uh, has also motivated uh, me, is the notion of uh, use-inspired research. While I'm personally excited by uh, when I'm reading a, a book that deals with the physics of uh, cosmology, mm -hmm. things that are 
driven by curiosity. In my own work, uh, I find it is uh, more uh, motivational if I can find how this is going to translate into a, a product or how it is going to make some sort of a, a difference. So for uh, some of my uh, research from uh, with some colleagues in, back in the 80s was connected with uh, how we could find uh, problems in underground power cables before the cable actually fails. Mm. And I think that uh, that led to patents and eventually the formation of a company by one of my colleagues, which now employs a number of people. So I feel uh, that sense of gratification mm -hmm. of having been involved in some sort of a, a project that then led to uh, a product and led to actual uh, economic uh, benefits. Yeah. Well, um, how beautiful. That's all I can say. Um, you inspire. Uh, you're such a gentle spirit, and I've um, felt that actually your presence on our campus has been just a positive thing for everyone. Uh, I wish you well in your continuation of um, your journey at the University of Connecticut and, and to continue to inspire young people as you have um, to look at these important areas you're talking about, things that are useful to us, um, things that allow us and remind us of our place and so many other things. Um, thank you. Well, I've I enjoyed say. our conversation and I thank you because it was uh, primarily my conversation with you last May at the conference and your encouragement that led me to uh, come here and uh, benefit from the ecosystem that you have here. So thank you. Thank you. Well, that's uh, coffee with Katina without the coffee. I think yours has gone cold and I have my invisible one here, but uh, that's another episode. All right. Thank you. Bye.